And it's always hard to get back in the flow of things, you know. We think of kids with summer vacation and all that. And so, you know, here we are in the middle of this series, and we're about to start Chapter 9, which is the middle of a three-chapter idea. And uh, you're probably thinking, what were we talking about? So as a result of that, I sent out a link last week. Um, and I promised Lois I'd do this. How many of you watched the link of the review of 1 Corinthians? All right, I told Lois I would give her the chance to show that she did her homework. But being a pessimistic preacher, I didn't think many people would. So we're going to actually watch the first five minutes of this review of 1 Corinthians. It's a bad teaching uh, precedent, I'm sure, to reward not doing homework with cartoons. But we're going to do it anyway, so I'm going to have a seat, and this will help get you caught up with where we were in this great book. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, written to a church community that Paul knew really well. Corinth was a major port city in the ancient world and had lots of temples to Greek and Roman gods. It was a big economic center. And so Paul strategically came here as a missionary. He spent a year and a half there getting to know people, talking to them about Jesus. And a whole bunch of people became followers of Jesus and formed a church community. You can read about all of this in Acts chapter 18. So after a while, Paul moved on to start churches in other cities, and he started getting reports that things were not going well at all back at the church in Corinth. It was plagued by all kinds of problems, and that's why he wrote this letter. It's broken up into five main parts along with a final greeting. And these five sections correspond to five main problems that Paul is addressing. And so the letter reads like a collection of short essays on different topics, but there are these core ideas that unite all of the pieces together. So here's what he does in each section. He describes the problem, but then he always responds to that problem with some part of the story of the gospel, which is the good news about Jesus. And he shows how they're actually not living out what they say they believe. And so this letter is all about learning to think about every area of life through the lens of the gospel. So let's dive in and see how he does it. In chapters one through four, the problem is that there are these divisions in the church. There are some other teachers who had come through town since Paul left, a guy named Apollos and then Peter, and people had picked their favorite teacher and then became groupies around that leader and then started to talk bad and disrespect people who favored another leader or teacher. And so Paul, his response to this is kind of sarcastic and sharp. He says, you have to be kidding me, right? The church is not a popularity contest. The church is a community of people who are centered around Jesus. Its leaders and its teachers are simply servants of Jesus. So while you might prefer one leader more than another, it's not worth dividing over and certainly not speaking poorly about each other. The center of the church is Jesus and the good news about who he is and what he's done. In chapters 5 through 7, Paul addresses some problems related to sex. There were a number of people sleeping around in the church. One guy with his stepmother, a number of other people still worshiping at the local temples to Greek gods and sleeping with the prostitutes who worked there. Not only that, but there were people in the church who were saying that this was all just fine. They said, hey, we're free in Christ. God's grace is bottomless, right? It's fine. Paul says it's not fine. And with the gospel in hand, he shows just how wrong-headed this kind of thinking is. He says, remember, first of all, Jesus died for your sins, including the ruin of broken relationships that's caused by sexual misconduct. And so if you're a Christian, sexual integrity is one of the main ways that we respond to Jesus's love and grace. Paul also reminds them that just as Jesus was physically raised from the dead, so our bodies will be raised from the dead, which means this. If your body is being redeemed by Jesus now and in the future, then what you do with your body matters. It matters a lot. And it's not yours to do whatever you want with. Paul's being super clear. Being a follower of Jesus involves no compromise when it comes to sexual integrity. In chapters 8 through 10, the issue is about food, but not just food preferences, like do you like or dislike a certain food. The issue the Corinthians were divided over is meat that came from animals sacrificed in the local temples to Greek and Roman gods. And there was a split between the Jewish and non-Jewish Christians about how to respond to this issue. And once again, Paul appeals to some core ideas from the gospel. 
He says, our allegiance, first and foremost, is to Jesus as Lord, not to any other gods. And so if you're in a situation where there's meat that's been dedicated to another god, and there are people around who might watch you and conclude, oh, look, hey, Christians worship Jesus, and they can worship other gods too. Paul says, if that's the scenario, don't eat the meat. Your loyalty is to Jesus, and you should love those people more than yourself and not mislead them. But Paul quickly qualifies this and says, listen, as Christians, we believe God is the creator of all things, including that animal. And the temple idols, we believe, are just pieces of wood and stone. So if there's no one around who's going to misunderstand your actions and you're hungry, eat up. You're free as a new human in Christ to follow your conscience in these kind of debatable matters. So what makes it okay in one situation to eat, but not in the other? The core principle is love. Love will deny itself and look out for the well-being of other people. And love, God's love, is at the core of the gospel. It's what Jesus did when he died for us. And so Paul says it's what Christians should do for other people. In chapter... That's as far as we're going to go this morning. Um... Looking back at the uh, poster from the video, I did uh, provide that slide. You can see on each side of the poster, um, that's a great resource, by the way, the Bible Project. There's, they don't just have books of the Bible summarized in that way. They have core doctrines and all kinds of different ideas. If you're more of a visual learner, I'm sure uh, it would be incredibly helpful to look at some of their stuff. And we want to give credit where credit's due. But if you see on the, on the poster, there's this two-step idea, define the problem and respond with the gospel. Keep that in mind uh, as we read this ninth chapter this morning. And the problem is still that bit that you heard about in the summary video. How in one scenario it seems to be okay to eat food sacrificed to idols, and another it's not okay. And uh, the determining factor is the gospel, something that Paul really does want us to sink our teeth into. Before I read this whole chapter, you're going to hear some very familiar passages, ones that we throw around uh, in common language, at least in Christianese language. You know, don't muzzle the ox, um, being compelled to preach the gospel, the line, I become all things to all people that I might win them is in this one. In a race, everyone competes to win the prize. And uh, all of those passages are so often used in uh, pretty strange, out-of-context ways in the wild world of Scripture proof texting. And they're all in this chapter. And in this chapter, they're very much all laminated to this idea of our calling as Christians being way more significant than our very human love for protecting our own rights. Don't be confused by Paul suddenly sounding like he's laying down a heavy or uh, uh, talking all about his authority or what he has the rights to. Um, and, and we're not going to get too deep into the weeds of what this means for apostles or pastors or preachers because that's really not Paul's main idea. Um, if I forget to say it later, you are meant to listen to what Paul has to say about his own life and you're meant to bring in some of your personal rights and freedoms and see if you're willing to lay them down uh, under the calling to preach the gospel. Um, Paul's using his real situation as a capital A apostle, we like to call him, and, and he's laying down his personal rights. If that can help this task, this race that he's on, and I think he expects all of us to be on the same race. Um, so let's, let's read uh, this passage from 1 Corinthians. I should turn there before I start reading it. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Am I not as free as anyone else? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus our Lord with my own eyes? Isn't it because of my work that you belong to the Lord? Even if others think I'm not an apostle, I certainly am to you. You yourselves are proof that I am the Lord's apostle. This is my answer to those who question my authority. Don't we have the right to live in your homes and share your meals? Don't we have the right to bring a believing wife with us as the other apostles and the Lord's brothers do, and as Peter does? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have to work to support ourselves? 
What soldier has to pay his own expenses? What farmer plants a vineyard and doesn't have the right to eat some of its fruit? What shepherd cares for a flock of sheep and isn't allowed to drink some of the milk? Am I expressing merely a human opinion, or does the law say the same thing? For the law of Moses says you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. Was God thinking only about oxen when he said this? Wasn't he actually speaking to us? Yes, it was written for us so that the one who plows and the one who threshes the grain might both expect a share of the harvest. Since we've planted spiritual seed among you, aren't we entitled to a harvest of physical food and drink? If you support others who preach to you, shouldn't we have an even greater right to be supported? But we have never used this right. We would rather put up with anything than be an obstacle to the good news about Christ. Don't you realize that those who work in the temple get their meals from the offerings brought to the temple? And those who serve at the altar get a share of the sacrificial offerings. In the same way, the Lord ordered that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. Yet I've never used any of these rights. And I'm not writing this to suggest that I want to start now. In fact, I would rather die than lose my right to boast about preaching without charge. Yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. I'm compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. If I were doing this on my own initiative, I would deserve payment. But I have no choice, for God has given me this sacred trust. What then is my pay? It's the opportunity to preach the good news without charging anyone. That's why I never demand my rights when I preach the good news. Even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I'm with the Gentiles who don't follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I'm with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. So remember, our passage today, chapter 9, is in the middle of chapter 8, 9, and 10. And, and which is one long kind of discussion about this issue dividing the church over what to do and not do about meat that had been sacrificed to idols. But remember, uh, it's really about relationships and not ribs. It's about brotherhood, not barbecue. It's about friends, not food, love, not lunch. You get the idea. Uh, in fact, even our meal after church today is not about having a meal. You, you read some things about that. It's about something so much bigger and more important. That's why we're emphasizing it so much this year. Well, the last verse of chapter 8 is just import as important for chapter 9 as it is to chapter 8. And uh, it's also the verse that connects chapter 9 to what we're going to talk about next week about idols in uh, chapter 10. Here's that line. So Paul wrote at the end of chapter 8, uh, as we call it, So if what I eat causes another believer to sin... I will never eat meat again as long as I live. For I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. We read it again. For I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. Just let that end phrase hang in your mind this morning a little while. For I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. Core values were all the rage a couple of decades ago. Every church had some, needed them, had them posted on their literature and on their posters. I, I think we even had some 
But that line from the Bible right there that we just read from God's word, I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. I don't remember that being our super popular high on the list core value of congregations. I don't know why, um, but there it is. It's obviously a core value for Paul, isn't it? Um, here are some of the mantras of our culture that our culture likes to indoctrinate us with. Um, you do you. You look out for number one. I don't care what anybody thinks. It's my life. And then a big favorite of mine that I always have to fight against because it comes out so, yeah, that's their problem. You ever heard yourself using lines like that? Um, that's kind of the opposite of, I don't want to do anything to cause another believer to stumble. If you're going to ingest the Word of God from chapter 8, verse 13, within church life or life as part of the family of God, or as you seek to try to display Jesus as the center of all life, it's often going to mean that they are your problem. They are your problem if you don't want to cause another believer to stumble. In verses 1 to 16, Paul, we read all kinds of things about Paul practicing self-denial in regard to his personal rights for the good of something greater. And he's basically calling on members of the church in Corinth, and I think 2,000 years later, the members of the church in Brooklyn, to be willing to do the same. Um, think about who he's writing to, because uh, honestly, I, I was starting to get ready to preach this sermon a month ago, and then we got into Advent, and then a month later it came back, and I was nearly kind of getting lost in the weeds of what does this say about apostles and leaders and all of this kind of stuff and their rights and everything, and then I realized, no, Paul's not even really talking about that. Even though everything he says about that topic is true, that's not what he wants us to really focus on, because he's not even writing to apostles. He's not even writing to preachers and teachers in this. He's saying, these are my scenarios, these are my freedoms that I lay aside, and we need to ask ourselves, what, what are some of ours? I remember meeting at Moody Pastors Conference many years ago. Stephen's dad used to take me there every year. And I remember a uh, preacher who had um, cerebral palsy and had an incredibly bad speech impediment. And there he is preaching his heart out in front of like 1,500 pastors at the famed Moody uh, Bible Institute Chapel. And kind of his punchline at the end is like, I got cerebral palsy. What's your problem? <laughs> you know, like, like he's doing everything despite his weakness and, and throwing it at us. Like we don't have cerebral palsy, but to apply that, we think, well, what are the excuses we make for not doing what God called us to do, right? That's, that's a little bit of the thinking that you w we want you to have here in this passage. And he kind of uh, steamrolls through all of those metaphors, examples, and illustrations from all walks of life. Um, and then more exactly the, the same when we get to this punchline in verse 12b. But we have never used this right. Here's another killer line here. We would rather put up with anything than be an obstacle to the good news about Jesus Christ. Let that one sink in a little bit. We would rather put up with anything than be an obstacle. Think about that statement for a few minutes. Apply it to your own life. To apply it to your own life, first of all, you have to have a personal willing to put up with anything value for the spiritual life of other people at such a level that it changes your lifestyle and behavior in actions, even in things that in and of themselves aren't bad. This, this is where it gets really frustrating, right? You know, like abusing animals. Think, yeah, you shouldn't abuse animals. That's bad for the gospel. If you're known as an animal abuser, you know, you drag your dog behind the car or something like that on purpose, you really shouldn't do that. We would all agree with that. But what about the things that are Legitimate freedoms. How many of those are we willing to let go of? So, so the I see nothing wrong with statement that we begin most debates has really nothing to do with this passage. If you look at, in your Bible at verses 13 to 18, um, in, in it's a passage that uh, often gets co-opted by uh, candidates for ordination. That's always a weird thing to go through and an even stranger thing to 
observe someone else going through or be part of an ordination council. But usually you're, you're expected to defend the idea that you have some kind of a special call to full-time ministry. So, you know, you're motivated to find anything. And this passage often gets used, you know. I'm, I'm under a compulsion. I'd, you know, I'd die if I didn't preach the gospel. And the problem is Mr. Ordinand is not a capital A apostle. He wasn't struck blind on the Damascus Road. He wasn't spoken directly to by the resurrected Christ to take the gospel to the Gentile world. If he is, we should probably delay the ordination a little bit if he thinks all oh, that's true about himself. But it's true about Paul. And Paul's saying that's why he's not trying to make a, be idolized for what he's willing to not require, and that's all of this support. He basically says, I have a special situation where... <laughs> Jesus intercepted me on the Damascus Road and said, you do this. He was struck blind. Paul says, I, I don't have any choice. Um, so, so he basically says, I, you know, I want to kind of guard that freedom. In, in the back of his mind, probably knows, you know, if Jesus gives you that clear of a mandate, he's probably going to make sure you, he's going to take care of you. <laughs> so, so Paul didn't need to, to kind of beat that drum. But he's saying, but, but it doesn't bother me because my, my big goal is this calling of the gospel. He'd, he'd be actually disobeying Christ by not doing what he was commissioned to do. Um, here are some remarkable statements. Verse 19. Even though I'm a free man with no master, I've become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. Let me read it again. Even though I'm a free man with no master, I've become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. Way back in Genesis, the family gets dysfunctional really quickly. Within the first generation, the first sibling rivalry ends in murder. And uh, God goes and he uh, confronts Cain, even though God already knows the answer. He says, where's your brother? And Cain lays out the big classic line that, again, is pretty much well-known in all literature and culture. And he says what? He says, am I my brother's keeper? I don't know where he is. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, Paul in verse 19 here says, yes, I am. I am my brother's keeper. So I'm willing to lay these things aside for the sake of the gospel. I don't want to, I don't want to cause any other believer to stumble. We're, we're really more familiar with, um, he, he says in verse 22 and 23, Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. We're more familiar with a translation like this one. I become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save or win, depending on your translation, some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Gospel blessings. Just think about that phrase, gospel blessings. If you brought 100 Christians into a room and gave them a little half sheet of paper and a pencil, and we said, you got three minutes, I want you to write down as many gospel blessings as you can think of, I, I kind of have a suspicion that most of us, I would include myself if this was a pop quiz and I hadn't spent all week in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we'd probably start writing down all the personal benefits that we get from the gospel. You know, we'd be thinking about things like staying out of hell after I die. It's a fantastic benefit. Um, being able to not live under a lifelong burden of guilt for sin, another great benefit. Being able to be confident that God accepts me, a fantastic benefit. Being able to see myself as a son or a child of God, these are all fantastic benefits. But when Paul says, he goes through all this self-sacrifice for the benefits of the gospel. I don't think he's talking about those personal benefits. Paul's really talking about being able to share in its blessings. I think he's talking about the spreading of the gospel. Paul's statement in verse 23 where he's doing whatever he can to avoid being a stumbling block to the spreading of the gospel. It appears that the good news going out is the blessing that he's trying to protect. That cracks open this last paragraph. Uh, the last paragraph in our passage is so often co-opted by Christian fitness or Christian athletics ministries as some kind of pro-athletics um, metaphor. And here's the athletics parallel down in the uh, verses 24 down to the end. I mean, remember, Corinth is a Greek town, and classical Greeks did love them some Olympic Competitions. That's where our whole Olympic ideal comes is from this whole area, right? So, so the games, there's all kinds of different games. There was 
the, the uh, Olympic Games, the Ithmian Games, I think they were called, and that would be the one that would be in everybody's minds reading this letter from Paul. So he's simply borrowing something that they know and that's deeply ingrained into their culture, and uh, he's possibly, he's probably remarking that people, to borrow his own praise, they're willing to put up with anything for things that really don't matter in the grand scheme of things, like athletic victories or challenges, championships. Uh, when Paul says, run in such a way as to get the prize, he wasn't intending to write a meme for your gym or a slogan for the t-shirts of your firm believer Christian run club. What's the prize? He says, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that does not last. If you were here on um, New Year's Day, we had a little kind of family lesson study, and we talked about the deals you got to make in life, that all life is about making deals. And that's not a good deal. Going into strict training to get a crown that doesn't last? Paul says we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Got some questions here. Who's we? What's it? Uh, who's we? I think it's for certain that Paul's talking about himself, but he's hoping that all of the readers in Corinth will have the same mind that he has here. And then I think 2,000 years later, he's hoping that everybody sitting in this room today will become part of this royal we. Uh, we should all be pursuing this particular prize. What, what's it? Uh, it, I think, is the, the primacy of God's plan for the world. The good news for the gospel. Remember how he was working through this whole letter? It's like, here's the problem, here's the gospel. You got this problem, you got this gospel. What does this problem say? It means you got to kind of grasp the gospel a little more deeply. It, there's a red light on your dashboard that says a gospel void in this area. You need to hang on to this. Um, the, the sacrifices, the, the other thing he's pressing on and pursuing here, the sacrifices we make in our lives as a community of faith. It means laying aside often many of our personal rights if those cause other people to stumble. It means becoming slaves of all rather than freedom fighters. And, and being in the, in the position to be able to proclaim the good news without unnecessary obstacles. For all of that, Paul's willing to take a much lower position in status, esteem, how he looks before people, his peers, people in the church for the good of the gospel. Don't for a second think that that would have been a popular thing in first century Greco-Roman culture. To live below your class, below your proper status, below what either your citizenship or your birthright or, you know, what race you were, what you'd achieved. To live below that, no self-respecting Roman citizen would ever consider such a thing. That's why Christian community is countercultural. It was then. It is now. Um, when Paul makes these statements about modeling his leadership in a, in a servitude position, it's, it's, keeping, it's in keeping with a lot of famous philosophy of ministry ideas he, he lays out in, in, the book of, in the letter to the Philippian church. It, it, all of these things that he's saying are still going to be a little bit of a rebuke to this congregation in Rome. Remember their big discussion over celebrity pastors and what they thought a leader should look like, sound like, all of those things. Paul's kind of still, that's, that's still involved here. He, he's revising existing notions and, of status, leadership, source of authority, power, and he's basically saying we don't fight with the weapons that the world fights with. If you look at all the concessions that Paul makes, you'll notice one that's lacking. This is like starting from 19 all the way down to that athletic metaphor. You'll notice something that's lacking. Um, he never says, when I'm with the strong, I also become a bully. He, he's, he, he accommodates his behavior, but his accommodating behavior has limits. You never see Paul saying, when I'm among drunkards, I get hammered. When I'm among adulterers, I fool around. When I'm among pantheistic idolaters, I become an all-world religions ecumenical guy. Paul doesn't really become all things to all people. Uh, we need to realize this is a figure of speech he's using, and it has its limits. It has its limits. 
But among the main idea, again, is still not what all of this means about Christian leadership definitions and practices and, and perversions. The big challenge is still, what are you willing to give up in order to have the good news about Jesus unhindered? What's this crown? That's another question I wanted to answer. Paul's readers, they certainly would have been drawn back to those Ithmian games that I talked about. And uh, by this time, do you know, by this time as he's writing this, do you know what the crown that the winner of the race received was made out of? We tend to think gold, right? You're going you're gonna to win a crown. We think of gold. Do you know what this one was actually made out of from my study this week? Celery. Celery. I mean, you don't need a trophy case for a crown made out of celery. That stuff doesn't even keep in the drawer in your fridge that's specifically made to keep it alive so that you can eat it in a few days. What goes into the compost dump more often than celery, right? You pull that stuff out, it's now like a limp puppet or something like that. It's like, I'm not going to eat that. So in it goes, makes your whole fridge stink. It's like, who let the celery go bad? So Paul has this picture. He's saying, here are people making all these sacrifices for a celery crown. That trophy box would reek. It's crowns made out of celery. Um, Paul's willing, he's, he's reminding them that they need to, that we're pursuing a crown that lasts for eternity. What is our crown? That's a lot harder to define than you think it would be. Um, my apologies for going back to Psalm 8, but there's that famous question, what is man? And you made them only a little lower than the God and crowned them with glory and honor. So here's this idea of glory and honor being something that humans were hardwired to pursue, but it's meant to be the one that God gives, right? It's a certain kind of glory and honor, this crown that lasts forever. I think the best bet to be able to define the crown would be to cheat a little bit and jump over to Philippians chapter 3. If you've got a Bible, do that. Um, Paul talks a lot in, in chapter 3 about all of the things that he used to value, the crowns that he was pursuing. He was circumcised when he's eight days old. He describes all of his high Jewish street cred. Um, and he says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them celery. He says worthless because of what Christ has done. Everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of And look, at, here's some crown things. The infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. How do you get to know him more? We talked about that last week, by doing what he calls us to do, um, by obedience and intimacy with him. Um, so I could gain Christ, become one with him. There's another crowning achievement, becoming one with Christ. I no longer crown, count on my own righteousness, rather the righteousness through faith in Christ. He says in verse 12, I don't mean to say I've already achieved this or I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection which Christ first possessed me. I focus on this one thing. Here's the race metaphor, forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. There's a lot here about Paul. He, he talks a lot about these people being his crown. In his, in, his, in his honor. And he says he's willing to forgo dominion, power, worldly esteem, fighting for his rights, crowns that don't last for this one thing. That's Paul. Uh, how deep is your love for the community of faith, for this local church and the desire to see it built up and mature, displaying Jesus as the center of life and pointing toward the invisible kingdom, invisible ways, and having that gospel proclamation going out. Some big ideas we're going to have a chance to reconsider next week in, in this series is the very real possibility of life being, because I haven't really touched it and Paul talked about it in here. I'm going to use them again next week. This idea that you can run this race and in the end be disqualified from the prize and, not, and, and miss out on, on the benefit. So Paul's sports metaphor, it talks about intentionality. You know, in the coming months, as your leaders continue to unpack new ministry initiatives for our church family moving forward, they're all going to be under the umbrella of attempting to be intentional in how we do things. And we don't want to be merely shadow boxing or just playing around about life together. How, how committed are you toward a gospel focus such as 
Paul is describing for us in this passage. I've been challenging you today to consider all the legitimate uses of your own time or your personal boundaries or your own free agent status that were possibly called to lay aside in order to work as a gospel-centered community. Next week, we're going to look at the idea that there are things that we just need to let go because they're not neutral, they're not positive. Hint, it's, it's idolatry. We really do need to let go of those things. But let me leave you with some questions from a book we were using in our men's Bible study. Here's some searing questions. He said, he asked, what are your expectations about your standard of living? Are there ways that laying down some of those expectations could help you serve God better? That gets close to home. Um, Everything costs something. In what specific ways... Are you possibly being called to become all things to all people for the sake of Christ? I don't know what your situation would be, but I think the answer is going to be the polar opposite of, I don't care what others think. (laughs) In what specific ways uh, is there a particular area in life where you need to pursue greater self-discipline and self-denial in order to run in such a way as to get the prize? We, we now have in Brooklyn a uh, track. You know, we never really had a proper track, an outdoor track anywhere until the high school was built, right? And now you drive along Carnwith, and there's actually a legit track. And uh, I notice when I go by uh, on my bike or in the car or walking my dog that there's often people there using the track to train. And you don't have to be uh, a kinesiologist or a, 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 a gym teacher to know you could just kind of sit there at the sidewalk and probably figure out, what kind of race the people that are using that track are training for. You know, if you stood there for 15 minutes and some guy's just going around and around and around and around and looking at his watch and doing like many, many, many loops at a strong, steady pace, you think, I think he's training for a long-distance race. If you saw somebody that was there and they were like, really fast, and then stopping for a few seconds and, you know, catching their breath, and then really fast. And, you know, they're, they're probably training for basketball team or football or for track and field sprinting. You know, if you see somebody like me just walking around in circles, there's somebody that just wants to walk around in circles and not trip over something. You're all training for something. If people watch your training methods what would they observe the crown is that you're chasing? Would they say, wow, they're really serious about this church thing, (laughs) about this being part of a community of faith and and sharing the gospel with people? Um, Would would it look like that's a crown that you're pursuing? Have, Have you thought about that life achievement as as any kind of a binding force in your life that you could use more of? There might be something there. Next week we're going to look at idolatry, and that, that's, that's a big stumbling block to this. But, you know, today, just as I close, I just want you to think about what, it, what, what, what crown have I been chasing in the last year or two? Um, and, and maybe I need to be thinking a little bit more from Paul's example of some things I could just cut out of my life in order to participate more in this group run we're called to. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that by your grace, you um, sent your Son that you might win us. That a people that would be your own, that would be free from the bondage of sin to come out and worship you, was something of such value that you were willing to lay down your perfect son, Jesus Christ, that we could do that. Lord, I pray from uh, the word today that you would uh, make it go deep in our hearts, that it wouldn't get uh, trampled upon, choked out by the weeds of all the other things that distract us, but would, uh, even in ways that it makes us uncomfortable, that it would go grow fruit that would help us grow toward a focus on the spiritual condition of others 
Help us to not do anything that would cause another to stumble. That we would make great sacrifices for the sake of winning many. That you would lead us in these things in your grace as you've called us to. In Jesus' name, amen. Worship team is going to lead us in a chorus and then we're going to uh, meet around the